Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, it is seven o'clock on the dot here uh, on the East Coast. And uh, my name is Megan. I'm one of the pastors at High Rock. Uh, and I'm really excited uh, to be just hosting Dr. Kelly Carter Jackson tonight. Uh, Kelly is a member of one of our High Rock congregations in Needham. And she is a professor at Wellesley College. Uh, and we are just excited to hear from you tonight, Kelly, uh, as you help inform uh, all of us on how we can understand protest and violence in this current cultural moment. Um, Kelly's written a book called Force and Freedom, which if you have not bought it, and this is an intriguing topic to you, go support her work. There it is, there it is. Go click that buy button from your local independent bookstore. Um, and help support Kelly's very good work. Uh, this is such a gift that you are giving tonight to us, Kelly, um, in just helping teach us and guide us through this. So thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, I'm gonna make you the host now. Okay, great. And I can just uh, share my screen whenever I'm ready. Yeah. Oh yeah, I can, all right. Uh, let's do this right here. Let me make it so that I can share it. And okay, can everyone see my screen? Hi, everyone. I can't hear you, but I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm really excited to talk about uh, not just my work and my research, but also sort of like the Lord's work in me, what I believe God has called me to do even more than a professor, but as a Christian, and that is um, to love the Lord God with all my heart, which I do, and to love my neighbor as myself. And that's a struggle. So <laughs> if we're being honest with each other. So uh, I really want to talk about, you know, this moment that we're in right now is really troubling for a lot of us. And we're trying to make sense of it and we're trying to understand it. And most importantly, as believers, we're trying to understand what this means uh, to us as Christians. And so I wanna just take maybe 20-ish minutes um, and talk about these ideas. And then I really wanna spend the last of the time or the remaining time that we have together just doing a Q&A and really having a conversation because a lot of these items that we're discussing today need to be teased out. And I wanna be able to make sure that everyone has clarification. So, uh, so we're gonna get started. <clears throat> so I thought it would be best to start with scripture. Uh, it's always a good place to start. And to remind all of us that no matter what ethnicity, no matter what background, no matter what demographic you have, we are all God's children. Um, sometimes I think that goes without saying, but I'm saying it tonight, we are all God's children. And I wanna use the verse Malachi 2.10, which says, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? And I think that's a really important verse to highlight because it reminds us that like God created us all, we're all his, we belong to him. And I think what breaks God's heart is division among his children. Um, I think it goes without saying that God hates racism, that racism is a sin. Romans 2.11 says that God does not show favoritism. And you won't unnecessarily see the word racism within the Bible, uh, but there are other synonyms for it. Uh, favoritism, favor, uh, some different versions say discrimination. Um, there are different ways in which we pick and choose people. Prejudice is another one. God is not here for it. Um, and I use a lot of these images just to show the myriad of ways that racism manifests itself in our culture. Sometimes we've seen it through school segregation. Other times we've seen it in really drastic, violent ways like the shooting at South Carolina. We see it in the Confederate flag. We see it in um, even in the way that black children and white children see themselves when we think of like the picture of the famous Kenneth Clark study and how racism has a psychological impact on children. Um, God hates this and God does not show favoritism. The second thing I wanna cover 
is this concept that all sheep matter. <laughs> and I got this idea from really thinking about uh, how people maybe on your Facebook feed or maybe you've said it yourself, all lives matter, all lives matter. And for black people, nothing can generate more of a visceral response. <laughs> Right? Uh, that that is like fighting words for a lot of black people. And I want to explain to you why. So I used the scripture of Matthew 18, 12 through 14, where Jesus is talking. He says, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly, I tell you, he is happier than the one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. So I think that when we think about this idea of all lives matter or all sheep matter, God cares about us as the collective. Yes, he does. But he also cares about us as individuals. That is why he will go after the one. So when we say things like Black Lives Matter, it's important to iterate that concept so that we know all lives can't matter unless Black lives matter. All of the sheep can't matter unless this one sheep matters, right? So God cares about the individual just as much as he cares about the collective. And I think that's really important to decipher the differences between the two. And we can talk about that more in Q&A as well. Also, I think uh, we've been throwing this word around a lot today, white privilege. Some people don't understand what that means. And for some people, white privilege feels like a weapon too. Like, don't put your privilege on me. I grew up poor. I worked hard. I earned this. And that might be true, right? But that's not really what privilege is about. White privilege doesn't necessarily mean your life has been easy. I want to say that again. White privilege does not mean your life has been easy. It means your skin color isn't one of the things making it harder, right? So you might have worked really hard all your life or grown up in poverty or faced challenges. That's not what we're talking about when we mean privilege. We mean that as a white person, there are aspects of racism that benefit you purely because of your whiteness. It's simply unearned power. So if we think about racism as a form of disadvantage, as something that harms Black people, that discriminates against Black people, degrades Black people, we also have to think about the corollary opposite, right? How does it benefit people? How is it profitable to people? How does it advantage people? Uh, racism is a double-edged sword. It works in both directions. So, Today, though, we want to talk about protests. <laughs> and I want to put these images before you because I think they're so powerful. And I put this statement up here because I got it from a book. Actually, one of my friends, um, this is his quote, but it's, it stopped me at the page when I saw it. And he said, the problem is when we look at violence today, the concept that's running through the majority of our heads is the idea of this. White people commit crimes, but Black people are criminals. White people commit crimes, but Black people are criminals. So in these two images that you see right here, on one side, you have Michigan State after it won its game. That's what happens when they won, y'all. <laughs> and then on the other side, you have Baltimore erupting after the death of Freddie Gray, who died unarmed in police custody. So I put these two images next to each other to really show you the double standard. When you look at the picture, maybe your left or your right, but with the white guy with the red baseball cap, people will look at that image after a game, after a Red Sox game and say, that's fans will be fans, college kids will be college kids or boys will be boys and we dismiss it and it's no big deal. And we're all excited, we won, or we're all sad, we lost. But these were the stakes of a, of a game. This is the response from a game. When we think about black life and we think about the unarmed killings of many black men and women, the response is one of rage and one of grief. And I think we need to be careful to really parcel out these double standards. Because if your idea is to think of white people committing crimes as a verb, white people commit crimes, it's, an, it's a verb. It's something that they can do, but it's not who they are, right? When we think about Black people as criminals and we see the same activity, it's not just a verb, it's not just an act, it's their identity, it's who they are. Now we know Black people are not 
criminals in that sense. But the way that we've internalized uh, behavior, the same type of behavior in two different ways is also a form of privilege. Who gets to be boys will be boys and who gets to be as thugs, looters and writers, right? For the same behavior. Um, so I think when we talk about the history of protest and the power of the protest, I think it's so important to talk about this within the context of the church, um, because the church has been so involved in protest history, but also very complicit within the, the oppression that causes the protest to come about. So we're going to tease out these ideas as well in, in the next few minutes. How do we understand protest? So I think if we're looking at an African-American context, you will always have people fighting for freedom. From the moment Black people were enslaved until this very moment, Black people have always resisted their oppression. They have always fought for freedom. So in this spectrum that you see right here, where you see you know, the march of the uh, sanitation workers or Fannie Lou Hamer saying, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired or Colin Kaepernick taking a knee, or even uh, violent protest in Ferguson, it runs the gamut, right? You can go all the way from sort of um, taking the knee or something that's can seen as like subservient or passive, all the way to something that's much more direct and violent and in your face. But regardless, Black people will always protest. They will always respond to their oppression. And that response is a spectrum in terms of how people see what is the most meaningful or effective aspect of that protest? Uh, I also think that this comes up a lot, and this is what I've been giving a lot of discussions about is the idea of looting, right? And looting as um, a form of protest, looting as violence. Um, and I think that one of the things that disturbs me so much about this current moment is that is that for a lot of us, no one was paying attention to the protest until the looting started. Uh, and I think that's because when we think about the fact that the way the media portrays a lot of these protests, it's not really a story to see a whole bunch of people marching peacefully. But the moment something happens like, look, they're burning down a building, um, then all the cameras rush. Um, and Martin Luther King Jr. says, like in the 1960s, when he's talking about the current moment, he says, a riot is the language of the unheard. It is the language of the unheard. It is how I get your attention. When I protest peacefully, you don't want to hear me. When I march peacefully, you don't want to hear me. When I riot in the streets, now everyone's paying attention, right? So we can, we can go back and forth about the utility of looting and how it works. But you cannot argue that it does not guarantee an audience and that it does not guarantee a response. Um, and I also think it's really important to make sure that we stay focused on the causes of these uh, quote unquote rights. So a lot of people have said they're destroying property, they're destroying businesses. And my first response is to push back on that and say, not just why, but are we more upset at the destruction of property, things that can be replaced, things that can be repaired, than we are the destruction of black lives, things that cannot be brought back, things that cannot be repaired. Um, so property versus people, like these are, these are moral, moral conversations to be having about where our priorities should be when we examine rage and when we examine protest movements. I also wanna talk about the double standard again, historically, because I'm a historian, that's what we do. We talk about the history. And I think when you go back to the founding of this country, there's no question that this country was founded on protest. This country was founded on violent protest, the destruction of property. If you look at the picture of the Boston Tea Party, um, we, especially here in Boston, I mean, there's a museum. You can go to the Boston Tea Party Museum. Where else can you like go to the scene of a quote unquote riot and buy like a magnet, you know what I mean? And buy a Christmas ornament and get like your t-shirt, right? I went to the Boston Tea Party Museum. Um, that is that is how this country was started. Um, and James McCune Smith says something really profound. He's a black abolitionist in the 19th century. And he says, our white brethren cannot understand us unless we speak to them in their own language. They recognize only the philosophy of force. 
So that when we think about the founding of this um, country and we think about, yes, the Boston Tea Party, but also Patrick Henry's give me liberty or give me death, this idea of, of revolution and violence going hand in hand. Even if we think about the American, the Confederacy, right? And how um, the American South believed that it was in their right to use force and to use violence, not just to sustain slavery, but also to maintain um, slavery as a, as a com complete country, a completely different country separate from the United States, that violence is America's bread and butter, violence is apple pie, and violence in a lot of ways is how we understand reform or change. So I say this to my students all the time, if you look at a historical timeline, if you look at the pinpoints on a timeline, most of the major pivots in history that we have hinge on violence, revolutions, wars, rebellions. Those are the things that become the great engines or accelerators of, of change, at least within this country. I also think that if we're gonna talk about the double standard of how we think about protest, I also pushed back on the civil rights movement a little bit. Uh, I wrote about this recently in an op-ed, but I think we have a tendency to look back on the civil rights movement with a lot of nostalgia and like rose colored glasses. We think that the civil rights movement was people walking arm in arm and holding hands and it's Martin Luther King and I have a dream and it's Rosa Parks who refused to give up her seat. And if you look at the optics of all of this, it all feels very pleasant and nice and warm and fuzzy and see, can't we just protest like this? Wasn't that great? Um, and that is not the civil rights movement at all. The, the way we really need to understand the civil rights movement is not about an orchestrated group of, of people pushing for nonviolence, but an orchestrated group of people responding to violence violence of people who are hosed down um, by officers who were attacked by dogs, violence of buses that were destroyed or bombed for people who were trying to register voters, violence of a 14 year old boy who was lynched in the South, the story of Emmett Teal and Mamet Teal. You can move from funeral to funeral throughout the movement, the death of four little girls, the assassination of Megger Evers, the lynchings that took place all throughout the 19th and 20th century, where basically two Black people are lynched per week over a 70-year period. And then also today, when we think about, you know, the unarmed killings of Black men and women by the police um, or others, it doesn't necessarily have to be the police, you know, when I think of George Zimmerman, he's not the cops. Um, but the grief that comes along with that, this is a picture of Michael Brown's father and Mike Brown's funeral after Ferguson. People are responding to death, to violence, to oppression all around them. And I think we have to be really clear about what these movements are about, but even more over what people are responding to. So why are we here? Why is it that we can draw like a straight line from slavery and the end of it, which we'll be celebrating on Friday with Juneteenth, to this very moment that we're in right now with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Maude Arbery and protests that are not just all over the country, but literally all over the world. How do we make sense of this moment, historically speaking? Well, I think that we have to understand first that racism matters, systemic racism matters. So not just the interpersonal uh, acts of rudeness or the inward or unkind acts, but how black and brown people and predominantly people of color move through this country has been one that has been heavily shaped by systemic racism. And this is not an incomplete list, but I just put the top three in terms of mass incarceration, right? The exponential numbers of black people that are incarcerated. I heard a statistic um, a couple years ago that startled me. It said that black people are 4% of the population in Massachusetts, 4% of the population, but 30% of the prison population, 30%. So those numbers aren't just 
organic. Oh, it just so happens like people are criminals, right? No, <laughs> like there is an intentionality behind that. Um, school segregation. Today, schools are more segregated in some places than they were back in um, pre-Brown versus Board of 1954. I think that when we think about the METCO, prob uh, METCO program and the fact that it still exists today speaks to school segregation that is still with us. And then when you think about health disparities, the ways that black and brown people are dying exponentially higher than their white counterparts, this is all a part of systemic racism. So let's talk about how we can work to change these structures, how, you know, a lot of people have asked me, well, what can I do? Well, what can I do? I, I have donated or I'm reading or I went to a protest. What can I do? And I always give them the James Baldwin quote, which is a little hard to swallow, but it's so true. He says that many of them indeed will be, hold on, I can't see the quote myself. Let me move myself to the, hold on one second moving myself so I can see it. Sorry, you guys. Uh, he says, many of them indeed know better, but as you will discover, people find it very difficult to act on what they know. To act is to be committed, and to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity. And I think that quote is so important because when white people start to read, and learn and educate themselves. The next step is to act on that knowledge, right? And in acting on that knowledge, James Baldwin says, be careful, you will put yourself in danger. And he's not necessarily talking about someone's gonna assassinate you, right? Or someone's gonna kill you, not all danger is deadly. But he's saying that when you get committed to doing the work, that you will have to grapple with the loss of your identity. And the loss of that identity is white supremacy. You will have to grapple with the fact that whiteness is not superior. Whiteness is not best. That not everyone should be assimilating to us, right? That we are not the norm. We are not the standard. And even more importantly, our identity as Christians is not found in white superiority, but in Christ. That we ought to be servants. That we ought to be working and helping the least of these. Uh, in American context, that is a really hard truth to deal with, not just because we have so much, but because so much has been invested in our psychological identities of white being right. Um, and it's so much a standard and a norm that we don't even realize how much we have benefited from the identity and the ideas of superiority around whiteness. So I hope during the Q&A, we can, we can talk about this and flesh this out even more. Um, I wanna give you a couple more historical quotes because you know, as a historian, I love the history. <laughs> I always, in everything I do, find a way to reference Frederick Douglass. Because <laughs> to me, Frederick Douglass is just, he's so much like a prophet of his time when he's talking about race relations. And he says this in 18, 66, shortly after the end of the Civil War, he says that there's a cause to be thankful, even for rebellion. It is an impressive teacher, though a stern and terrible one. Then he cautioned us to remember that the thing worse than rebellion is the thing that causes rebellion. So as we look in our current moment and we see protests all over the country, all over the world, and in some instances, we see violence, we see chaos, we see disruption. He says, don't be distracted by that because the thing that's worse than that rebellion, what's worse than the protest are the causes of the protest, are the causes of the anger and the rage. I also wanna talk about uh, a scripture that I think is a really good um, reference to pinpoint some of the things that we are dealing with, particularly as white Americans, even, even more specifically in this region that we live in, in this Metro West area of Boston, this really wealthy area of Boston. When I saw this scripture, I was floored. Um, it's James five verses one through six. It's a little lengthy, but I wanna read it because it's so important. It says, now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted 
and your moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and your silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. So when I think about the slate of killings that have happened with George Floyd over what, like uh, currency, something about currency fraud, right? When I think about Breonna Taylor, who was literally sleep in her bed. When I think about Ahmaud Arbery, who was going for a jog. Um, these are people that were acting in ways that were completely normal in our daily lives. And those very acts, those very ideas of just blackness was weaponized against them and brought about their death. And that's something really, really heavy that if we are trying to have our heart break with the things that breaks God's heart, we really need to sit with James. We really need to sit with the hard truth of how have we been complicit? How have we been responsible? How have we ignored the suffering of the least of these? So I want to give you one more scripture. This is Proverbs 24, 24. And it says, whoever says to the guilty, you are innocent, will be cursed by peoples and denounced by nations. I think that before the cell phone, before all of this footage, there was a lot of the benefit of the doubt given, particularly to police officers. The first question people asked was, well, what were you doing? Well, what did he do? Well, what did she say, right? The question was always, there had to have been something this person was doing to bring about this demise. Um, and the Lord is saying, listen, you are not innocent. And not only are you not innocent, and not only do we have the footage and the receipts, right? But that the world is watching that all around the world in Germany and UK and in France um, and in South America, it says you will be denounced by nations. This is a really critical moment that we're living in as Americans. We have a severe turning point in our history where we can decide um, how honest we're going to be about our shortcomings and how progressive we're gonna be about actually implementing change. Um, I think that when we think about the church, we have been complicit, people. We have just been complicit. Um, and I say this because you don't get the institution of slavery without the blessing of the church, right? The church sanctioned the institution of slavery. They paid for their churches with the institution of slavery. They blessed the slave ships each time one was en route. If you think about this image in the center of the Klan uh, and literally using the Bible as a weapon, right? Burning crosses in people's yards. It doesn't get any more complicit than that aspect, than that blending of the Klan and the church. We have to be honest about that history. And even at this very moment, you know, we can say, well, slavery was in the past and segregation was in the past. No, segregation is with us very much to this day. When you look on the pictures on the far left and you see that there is an all black church and an all white church, that is also the church's doing. Segregation is also sanctioned by the church. I mean, I think it kind of goes without saying the fact that, you know, my husband and I, my children, we're the only black American attendees at the church. Uh, there are two other black families. That is, that is not just happenstance, right? If, if I were to talk about the church that I attended before, it was all black. That was not a coincidence. Oh, hey, we just happened to show up at the same time, right? There is a reason why we still have division in the church with us today. And that is because the church is responsible for that 
division for that divisiveness. And if we're not honest about that, we can't expect to do anything outside of the church if we don't deal with the division that we all live with inside the church. So I wanna also say that when we think about protests, this moment isn't just about policing. I don't want anyone to think that the protests are about police reform or defunding the police. That's part of it, sure, that's absolutely part of it. But for all of us, particularly as believers, this is a pro-life issue, a pro-life issue that we cannot be so enraged and so angered um, by the death of unborn children, more so than we are about people who are already here walking around the world with us that if we don't look at this as a life and death issue, as a pro-life issue, how we treat one another, um, that we are doomed to not only repeat these things again, but we are also putting ourselves in the best position to deal with God's wrath and to deal with God's justice. Um, and I don't wanna deal with God on those terms. I really, really don't. But I, I am afraid about how how we proceed from here, not just for me as an African-American, but as a believer, I want Christians to be at the forefront of this. I want us to be at the forefront. Um, and I speak personally, not just for the children in this image, but that's my son standing in front of our door, right? This is a pro-life issue for him. This is a pro-life issue for me and my children. I mean, it's an issue that we all need to be held responsible to or for. So I will end with uh, these couple quotes. Yeah, these two scriptures, I think this will be good. And then hopefully we'll have time. How are we on time? Oh, good, okay, good. We've got like a half hour. That's perfect, that's perfect, okay. So Philippians two, three, four. Mind you, this is like the Bible verse I keep as my like signature in my email. Um, but it's just, it's such a powerful reminder of how we ought to treat one another. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility, value, value others above yourselves. For not looking at your own interests, but at each of you to the interests of others. So for some of us, you know, the killing of the unarmed killing of people by the police will never have a direct impact on our lives. We will never worry about be, being pulled over by the cops and, and being killed. If you're a white American, that's part of privilege, right? Your skin color does not have, is not um, uh, a point against you. Um, but I think that's not the point. The point is that we need to be invested in the interests of others, whether it benefits us or not. And then John 13, 34 says, a new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Um, that is the second greatest commandment. We love God with all of our being and we love our neighbors as ourselves. But how can you love your neighbor if you can't name them? If you don't have people of color in your life and not one, don't count me, right? <laughs> <laughs> like more people than just than just us. Um, how people of color can be so integrated in your life, so integrated in your life that you can say, I love my neighbor. I love my neighbor, whether they follow my beliefs or not. I love my brother and sister because we all have one father. Um, I also want us to think about the fact that you know, I study. I study the abolitionists. Uh, that's that's my uh, bread and butter. And Joshua Easton um, says this in 1837. He's he's talking about the abolitionist movement, and he says abolitionists may attack slaveholding, but there's a danger still that the spirit of slavery will survive in the form of prejudice after our system is overturned. Our warfare ought not to be against slavery alone, but against the spirit which makes color a mark of degradation. So yes, have we abolished the institution of slavery? Absolutely, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. But the spirit of slavery, the spirit that makes color a mark of degradation, anti-Blackness, that is still very much with us today. 
And I use the abolitionists as an example because the abolitionists were one of the most diverse social movements on the planet. They were black, they were white, they were slaves, they were fugitives, they were free black people, they were poor people, they were men and women and you know wealthy people. There, there is no stereotypical abolitionist. The group was that diverse. And they were motivated by their love for one another by their love of God, because many of them were, were Christians and believers, but for their love for one another. And so when I look at the abolitionist movement, I'm so empowered by the group of people that I study because I look at these small group of men and they were not a lot of abolitionists. I tend to think, there's a tendency to think that everybody in the North was an abolitionist. No, <laughs> there were only a few, you know, a few hundred, maybe a couple thousand abolitionists. They were seen as fanatics. They were seen as radical but they accomplished something no one thought possible, which was the abolition of slavery. But I say to you as the descendants of abolitionists, our work is not done. We may have abolished slavery, but we have not abolished the spirit, which makes color a mark of degradation. And I hope you will all be encouraged to really take up that challenge. I wanna leave you with some takeaways because you know, I'm a professor, I gotta give you takeaways. <laughs> um, I want you to ask yourself, why are we here? Why are we in this moment? Why are we protesting? Or maybe why are you being interrupted by protests, right? Uh, if you're not. Um, I want you to think about the fact that we are all God's children and that God hates racism. I want you to see racism as the sin that it is. I want you to learn more of this history. I can't tell you how many people have hit me up saying, what can I read, what can I read? Yes, do that, educate yourself. Uh, I think reading is the first step. And also don't ask your black friends to do the work for you. You do the work yourself. There's a thing called World Wide Web. <laughs> I need to do that work yourself, right? And then after you've started the work of learning what it is and all of the history that has really brought our country to where we are, I think it's equally important to make sure that we unlearn the histories, the ideas, the notions that have really fostered white supremacy as our baseline perspective. I don't think we appreciate how much the idea of white supremacy has permeated through our culture. And I don't mean in the egregious ways of like the Confederate flag or a cross burning, but I mean in the ways that we interact with each other, in the ways that we make purchases, in the ways we choose where our children go to school and where we live, that the identity of white supremacy fuels every decision Americans make. And then number four, if you're participating, even if you don't think you are, that goes back to what I said before, everyone is complicit. Every, no one's hands are clean. Uh, I think it's really easy to sort of look at racism and say, well, I'm not a bad person, but I don't think that way. Um, well, those are sort of the radicals. But Ibram Kinde talks about the fact that you know, you can be a racist or you can be an anti-racist, but you can't be Switzerland, right? You can't say, my name is Bennett and I'm not in it. You really have to think about, am I constantly working to overturn this system or am I just being comfortable and complacent? And if you are, well, then you know which category you fall in, right? So consider where you live. Consider where you attend church. Consider your friendships. Have a real reckoning with how you've oriented your life. And then lastly, it's our duty to live this out, not as a one-off, not as a checkbox. So when people say to me, what can I do? What can I do? I'm always hesitant to answer because I know this is not a checkbox. This is not a write a check and you're good. This is not our we're friends and we're good. This is a mindset. This is a lifestyle. This is a daily renewing of your mind moment by moment. Um, I've always told people it's, it's like veganism. You cannot claim to be a vegan because you didn't have meat for lunch, right? <laughs> I wasn't racist at lunch, so I'm not a racist, right? It's a constant, I will not eat meat. I will not consume dairy. It is a part of your life. It is how you have invested yourself financially, what you choose not to buy meat or dairy. But also it is, it is something that you will do most likely for the rest of your life. So you cannot approach racism as a diet. 
you cannot approach uh, abolishing racism as like a 40 day detox, right? Um, that it is day in and day out, uh, 365, constantly loving your neighbor as much as you possibly can. So I wanna open this up for questions. I'm excited to talk to you guys. My only preface that I have of questions is this quote by James Baldwin, which I think is so good. And he talks about you know fostering a healthy discussion. He says, we can disagree and still love each other. Facts. Unless your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to exist. So we can disagree on a lot of things. What we can disagree about is the fact that I'm a human being. What we can disagree about is the fact that my oppression is real. My, um, my identity and humanity and existence is real. Um, and so I want you to keep that in mind as we you know, open up this space for questions uh, to really think about how it's okay to disagree. You may not like everything that I said, um, but I want you to keep in mind, like forefront, that we are all God's children, that we all come from one creator and that we all belong to him. So thank you for listening, guys. Kelly, can you see uh, the Q&A button on the bottom? Uh, I think so, hold on. I'm gonna exit out of sharing my screen. Can I do that? Oh wait, hold on. No, stop share, okay. And see, what is it, the Q&A? Oh yeah, okay. Oh wow, there's a lot of questions, okay. So um, do you, should I read this? Could you read, loud? you do not have to answer all of the <laughs> questions. You can be selective about which questions you'd like to answer and just read the question <laughs> out loud um, after you decide to answer it. Um, yeah. It says, uh, the first question, I'm not sure who it's from, but that's okay. I, I won't call out names if people don't want that or want anonymity. Um, but it says, I'm sure in the US in 2020 is not the only country that is dealing with racism. Of course not. What can we learn from other countries or time periods that have dealt with this in a better way? That's a really good question. Um, so the short answer is, I won't call it racism. I will just call it disunity or division is all over the world. So America does not have a monopoly on it. It's in China, it's in India, it's in South Africa. If you look at apartheid, it is in Australia. There is no, there's no place you can go. So when people are like, I'm going to Canada, it's in Canada, right? Like racism is everywhere. I will say that, is there a better way to deal with it? Um, I don't have a good answer for that because I think that the answer is not sort of a one, uh, one size fits all model. Um, I don't think that what happens in South Africa to overthrow apartheid and what happens in the United States and what happens in India to end the caste system are the same thing. Um, and I also think that in a lot of ways, no one has accomplished this because even when systems get overturned, like the institution of slavery, we are still dealing with the spirit of slavery. Um, and so, no, we haven't, there, there are places that are doing it a little bit better than others, um, but no one has succeeded in doing it correctly or perfectly, I should say, all together, all the time. Um, so can I just scroll down and do the next one? I'd love to hear your thoughts on, oh, okay. So this is from Anne. I won't give last names. Uh, she says, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how the church as an institution should participate in anti-racism in this current moment. Churches are traditionally nonviolent organizations, but it sounds also like some level of disruption or violence, she puts in parentheses, is necessary for change. It sounds like there are two things. Our response is Christians, the individual, and our response is the church, institutional. What should the church be doing right now? And what should Christians be doing right now? And what does it look like to be at the forefront? Man. Oh, and you're Wesley alum. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, man, that is 
What I would like to see more is of what the church can do now is actually some steps that High Rock is taking right now. And that is to sort of, no pun intended, but to really have a come to Jesus moment and to say, okay, how have we played a role in this? How have we contributed to this problem? And then what can we do to change that? How can we make sure that our churches are more inclusive, that our churches feel welcoming to all people, that we're not asking people to assimilate into us as we are saying, we are opening and welcome and inclusive of everyone. Um, and that's something I wish we would do more of, but I think it's very difficult given the way segregation works in this country, uh, people are very comfortable with their segregation and people really want uh, to not have to change. But the church has to be at the helm of that. It has to be because if we continue to stay segregated, you know, we send the greatest message to the public. Um, so I think we need to take real moves to make sure that like we're not just inclusive because of like tokenism, but we're really working to make sure that everyone feels like that Christ is for them um, and that we understand that Christ cares about the oppressed. He cares about the one. Um, he cares about Black lives and that we have to do that too. Uh, next question, what are some of the best practices or strategies for speaking about the Black Lives Matter movement, protests, systemic racism to family members who are either first generation immigrants or non-Americans? How can we provide the necessary history of context in a way that it can be received well? I would say that, and also another Wellesley alum, yay. <laughs> um, I would say that you know, I always talk about getting as much information as you can through books, through through podcasts, through articles, through op-eds. Learn as much as you possibly can. And then when you learn, find ways to connect that knowledge with your family members, with your loved ones. I don't think anyone has ever sort of like read a book and, and you know, was like, that's it, I'm changed. But the re relationships that we have with one another, when we can talk about how these experiences have impacted us or impacted our lives, I don't think our friends or family members will be quick to dismiss us when we speak from our hearts and when we tell them about why this matters and how it impacts us all. I think that if we're working to build relationships with, with one another, um, that's a really great way to be able to do that. I think, um, you know, we've talked in, in the church before about listening, about learning, about lamenting, about creating leverage. And I think that those are four awesome ways that you can do that within your household, within your friendship circles. Um, and then like, don't stop there, but like wash, rinse, repeat. So like continue to listen, continue to learn, continue to lament and then leverage and, and let that be a model uh, for you in going forward. Um, this is Case, Casey, apologies for the long question. I hear you on being an anti-racist and how it's a mindset and a lifestyle. Oh no, where to go? Hold on, I lost the, the like questions are scrolling up. So um, thank you, where to go? Uh, one second. Where did that question go? It just disappeared. I, I see it on my screen. Do you oh, have, do you can you read it? Can you? Yeah, uh, sure. oh, uh, oh, I see it again. I see it again. Okay. okay, yeah. I hear you on being an anti-racist and how it's a mindset and a lifestyle. My question is on dismantling systemic racism in my state, in my country. I think these things are obvious. I'm open to feedback here. But we need to defund the police, end mass incarceration, end redlining, and get funding to black and brown neighborhoods. Black and brown people need economic and political power. What are the issues we should focus on to end systemic racism and how do we move on these things? And what has history shown us in terms of what works and lasts? So I'm gonna pull from my friend and colleague, Ibram Kende. Ibram Kende wrote a book called How to Be an Anti-Racist. I had the book with me somewhere in my office. Anyways, he says that if you wanna bring about change, you have to change the laws. Because he says, when you change the laws, you change the culture. So he says, for example, interracial marriage, right? Or what was called miscegenation uh, was considered illegal. And then the laws changed and it basically said, no, you can marry whoever you want. And then interracial relationships became less of a stigma and less of um, 
an issue. So he says, change the law, you change the culture. I actually think it's not rocket science. We actually know how to make these changes. We know how mass incarceration works. We know that the, the criminal justice system is set up against the poor. We know when the poor can't afford to you know, get their bail money or when you can't afford a good lawyer or when you know a lot of this is not just about color, it's also about class. Um, we know laws that create voter suppression, right? That keep people from being able to change these policies. So, um, you know, there are a lot of ways that we can actually change this with policy. Um, and I don't think it has to be like, you know, we all have to like forfeit all your wealth, right? Although I do think forfeiture of power is very much a part of that, but uh, it is possible. It is absolutely possible. And there are ways, small ways in which I think we have seen it done before on a much micro level, but it can be it can be done on a macro level as well, and you can pick any area, whether it's public health or school segregation. We know how to do this work. Scholars have been writing about this for eons. The question is not how we do the work or when we'll do the work, but it's the will to do the work, meaning people have to have the desire to create this change. Um, the many people know, oh, many people I know reduce racism to person rather than a structure. Not all police officers are bad. How do you help white people recognize structures? Very good question. So yeah, I think that there's a reason why um, people love the movie The Help, right? <laughs> because it makes it seem like racism is just about bad manners. Like it's about how you treat someone and oh, I'm nice. and. Or we think that racism is just um, the N word, right? It's things that you shouldn't say. Um, but really racism is all about power. Um, uh, I'm forgetting Beverly Tatum is a scholar who says racism is not just prejudice. It's not just, I don't like you because you're black. It is prejudice plus power. So when we had talked before about white privilege and, and we said it's not, um, it's not that you haven't worked hard or it's not that your life has been easy. It's that your life has not been made harder because of your blackness. So if we were to think about structural racism in that way, it's not necessarily about, um, you know, manners or unkind words or, or how hard you work, but it's about how we have set up a system of privilege and advantage through whiteness so that um, we have made it so that racism is not just all bad. It's not just all discrimination. Racism is profitable for a lot of white people. Racism has been beneficial to a lot of white people. And that is how we have to understand how the system works to advantage. And there's a lot of good books about that. There's a, a book I like to use in my class called When Affirmative Action Was White. And it talks about all the government policies that were put in place specifically to benefit white people and to generate wealth for them. So if you think about the Great Depression, um, and that's a moment where it's like an equal playing field, right? Everybody's poor, everybody's hurting. And then when you think about the New Deal, laws were created to help get people out of their the economic um, uh, um, poverty, depression. depression. But those laws said specifically, but migrant workers can't benefit from this and domestic workers won't be able to benefit from these laws. Why would they say that? Well, they couldn't say, well, black people can't get these checks and black people can't get unemployment. But if we say domestic workers of which like nine out of 10 black women were, if we say migrant workers, which about eight out of 10 black people were, then you effectively and economically disenfranchise an entire group of people. So that is what systemic racism uh, looks like. That is how it works and functions. Um, next question, how do I get older generations who tend to glorify MLK's nonviolent Christian approach to understand that he did not change the narrative on his own, that methods like the Black Power Movement and Malcolm X were also required to dismantle those systems. Absolutely. So one of the things that Malcolm X does, because Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. were friends. They, they were very friendly. And, and Malcolm basically says to him, listen, 
let me be the radical. Let me be the one that everybody's afraid of so that they will want to deal with you over dealing with me, right? I'll, I'll say by any means necessary. Um, and then you bring them the nonviolence and maybe we can actually get some change because people will be more willing to deal with you than they are willing to deal with me. Um, but you know, like how I mentioned before, like there's no, there's no one way to protest. We've seen so many different forms of black people protesting their oppression. Uh, you'll find that, yeah, there's a spectrum in terms of how people will respond to their oppression, but that, you know, people, particularly in the black community, love Malcolm X just as much as they love Martin Luther King. Dare I say people love Malcolm X more than they love Martin Luther King. And I think that, you know, the nostalgia that we have with King is a false one. Um, if, if King were alive today, or if we were to go back to the moment in which he lived, he was hated. He was villainized. There is a reason he was assassinated, right? <laughs> like he was not this beloved person who had a dream and everyone's like, oh my gosh, you're the greatest. Like people hated King. Um, and so we also have to be honest about that history. We, If we go back in that moment, King's approval ratings are dismal. Um, and that is because people saw him as a troublemaker because he was, you know, uh, stirring up the status quo. Um, and so, yeah, I think, again, if you read more books about history, if you get more understanding about this moment in time, we realize that that King is actually not that different from Malcolm X. Um, I think the biggest difference between these men was their faith, right? Um, they were both religious men, but I think the way that Martin Luther King was trying to approach his his movement was through a Christian-centered lens, and that's really important. Um, I imagine that many folks gathered here are already committed, or at least nominally so. Have you had positive experiences engaging people who simply don't feel this is as important? Oh, have I had good experiences? Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> um, have I had positive experiences engaging with people who don't think that this is that important? No, no, I haven't. I I will say that um, this moment feels very black and white, no pun intended. But I I have sort of, and you can say what you want about this, but like I really curated my friends on Facebook to where that the people who are with me on Facebook are my friends, that they share my values in a lot of ways. Uh, and I've, I've seen on Facebook, one of my friends posted like in the past two weeks, I've defended 15 people. <laughs> right? Like, and it's, and it's very, part of that is because, you know, social media is not the place to have these discussions, but also because there are people that are simply going to see these movements as an interruption, as a nuisance, um, as problematic, um, as wanting something from them that they're not willing to relinquish. Um, there are some people that are also just completely oblivious. So even my next door neighbors, you know, uh, Nathaniel said something to them. My husband was talking to them and I'm like, oh, hey, how's Kelly doing? And Nathaniel was like, yeah, she, she's been really busy. You know, she's got a lot going on. Oh, what, what's she doing? And he's like, have you not watched the news? <laughs> like, have you not seen what's going on? Like, but you know, they're, it's like they're in their quarantine bubble and they're doing barbecues and, you know, it, these things don't matter to them the way that we think they do to other people. And, and I'm not convinced that even, you know, reading my op-eds or, you know, engaging with them would necessarily change much. Um, not in the, in the, in the instant moment. Um, but yeah, I don't think that I have been able to have as many meaningful interactions with people who are opposed to this. I will say I've had very meaningful interactions with people who are willing to engage, who are willing to do the work. That is where I have been most encouraged. Um, so yeah, I think that's I think that's really positive. Um, this is Amber. I live in small town Missouri. I'm noticing that helpful dialogue often halts with vague Christian tropes, and it's maddening. I think it's rooted in fear. I believe I can only offer questions and hope that it shakes loose at some point. Do you have any questions 
to ask people who are white knuckling ignorance denial through the lens of their brand of American Christianity. Mm. Oh man. <laughs> I mean, okay, so can we be honest? Can we real talk on this Zoom? <laughs> I feel like that has been my biggest grievance with the church, particularly the white evangelical church that um, has not wanted to see um, the oppression that the least of these experience has not wanted to believe Black people when they were saying these things were happening. And we're more invested in just finding like a pro-life candidate than they were anything else. So I have a lot of Christian friends who are like, abortion trumps everything for me. Like that's that's all that matters. But my defense is, well, you can't be pro-life about this one issue and not and not say that Black lives matter and not be able to get that out of your um, mouth, right? Like that is a pro-life issue. Uh, not just when I'm pregnant, but what happens when I have that baby? Like that pro-life ideology has to be lived out through every phase of someone's humanity and being. It can't just be we, we care before you're born. We have to care when you're elderly. We have to care when you're a teenager. We have to care at every phase and moment of someone's life. We have to be pro-life. Um, that's how I push back on a lot of that. Cause I, sometimes I feel like that's where a lot of like the tension lies, um, politically speaking at least. Um, but yeah, I mean the, it's, it's, I have a harder time sometimes with Christians than I do with non-believers. <laughs> um, and that to me is really disheartening because again, we've not had an honest conversation about the church's love affair with racism, the church's love affair with white supremacy, the church's belief that their way is the only way. And when I say their way, I'm not talking about Christ. I mean, if you even think about the history of ministry work, right? It's so saturated with racism and assimilation and, you know, literally beating people over the head, not to get Christ, but to get whiteness to get like these rules and these this this legalistic framework that is not of God. Um, I mean, those things we still we still see to this day. Um, how are we on time? Oh, we are like over time. Um, oh, last question. Okay. Well, you can stay on if you want to. If you have more time, <laughs> you can answer more. Okay, I will have um uh, okay, there are two questions. I see Karen and I see Aaron. Oh, hey, Aaron, I know Aaron. Okay, so, um, so Karen, I hope I'm saying that right. So what are your thoughts on reparations? Uh, where can we start and what's the long-term goal? So reparations, short answer, yes. Um, I think about I think about Pastor Dave's sermon on Sunday and um, my, my husband was like, oh my gosh, have you ever heard a white pastor talk about reparations? <laughs> Um, and I was like, actually, no, uh, but it was so refreshing. So thank you, Pastor Dave. I think it was so refreshing to just say, of course, reparations. Of course, you cannot just say, I'm sorry, right? You have to repair what has been broken. So in a very simplistic uh, way, my kids love Daniel Tiger. And in Daniel Tiger, there's a song where it says, First you say, I'm sorry, then how can I help? And it's like, I can't sing. But anyways, it's like, you apologize and then you say, how, how can I help you? How can I make this right? Um, I think too many people have been quick to say, I'm sorry, and not, how can I help? Even more egregious, white people have been too quick to say, do you forgive them? Do you forgive them? They just shot up your whole church. Do you forgive them? They just killed your son. Do you forgive them? Right? <laughs> as though that will absolve, that forgiveness absolves the wrong that has been done and, and committed. So I absolutely believe in reparations. Now, what that looks like um, and how that gets facilitated is a policy issue. And I think it's one that is, is a little trickier to get around. You know, I don't think that um, it should just be like, you get a check, you get a check, right? Especially because of like ancestry.com, people like, you know, my great great grandmother was black. Like, right? like, so I think there's definitely a stickiness to this. 
Um, but I, I still think, and I'm a firm believer that it can be done, that it can be done and it should be done just because it is hard does not mean it is impossible. Um, and does not mean that we should not try. Um, if I, if I were to give my personal opinion, I think it would be great to see reparations for black business owners. I think it would be great to see reparations for home loans and the ability for black people to own their home because that's how you generate wealth. I think um, in terms of student loans and education, I think that is another thing that generates wealth. And I would love to be able to see loan forgiveness or some type of program that would get, you know, blacks higher education. Um, I think there are a lot of ways that you could do it. Um, let's see. Um, there's someone, how do you have a professional web page? You can just go to my website. It's just kellycarterjackson.com. Um, if you want to contact me professionally, but some of you guys are friends, so text me. Um, and then this is how, how a son, what son? I hope I'm saying that right. Um, class of 02, Wellesley, what? How do you approach the silence? I now live in New Hampshire in a 97% white community. When I was, when I raised the concerns of the lack of communication about race and equity in their schools, I was met with dead silence. I understand that there is the readiness aspect and that when others are not ready to come to the table, you cannot force the discussion. But man, this is terrifying that my community cannot even talk about the issue. Man, like that is so true. I don't know if we're more afraid of, of engaging because, because we don't wanna offend or engaging because we know that it will cost us something or engaging because, you know, we know that we've been complicit. We know that we're wrong. We know that it's very difficult. I mean, the, the worst thing you can call a white person is a racist, right? And, and I think what white people fear is not like, of course it's easy to call like, you know, Billy Bob with his Confederate flag a racist, that's easy. The hard thing is what happens when like, you're a liberal, you're well-meaning and yeah, you're low-key racist, right? <laughs> that conversation has been incredibly difficult to have because again, we're unwilling to be honest with ourselves about the role that we have played. Um, but I would, I would so appreciate it if someone would just say, Yes, I know that I'm a racist, that I have done things, that I have been complicit. I know that. I am sorry. Now, how can I help, right? Now, how can we take it from here to get beyond the guilt? Because guilt doesn't do good for anybody. Like guilt is useless, especially if it doesn't motivate you to change or motivate you to have these hard conversations. Um, I think guilt does not do anything. We have to be able to talk about it. And it doesn't matter if you live in an all white community. You know, I lived in North Dakota for four years and we were the only black people like in a 20 mile radius at least. <laughs> and, and I think that you still have to have these conversations because we live in a mobile world. People travel, people go places. Um, you think about the way you think about things, how, how you um, invest, how you vote, how you make decisions are all intensely impacted by race. Whether you live around Asians or Native Americans or Latinos or black people or only white people, everything in our society is guided by race. So we absolutely have to talk about it. And we are absolutely required to put this kind of stuff in the curriculum, whether black children are in the school or not, whether Native American children are in the school or not, this is our history. This is our collective American history, not just the Boston Tea Party, but also this George Floyd moment. That's America, right? This is, this is something that we all need to know. And so, um, no, you don't get a pass for living in a homogenous society. And yeah, we have to be willing to have the hard conversations. But once you can get over that, and once you can actually move from conversation into real action, I think we would all be surprised and moreover pleased by the amount of change that we could produce. So um, 
I will end it there. I think that's our last uh, question. We went about 10 minutes over. I hope that's okay. This was great, guys. I wish I could like see you all. <laughs> Kelly, thank you so much. This was such a gift to our community. We are so blessed to have you as part of our church and to have you teach us. Seriously, y'all, you are so lucky. We are so lucky that we get to hear from her. She is like a hot commodity right now. <laughs> us in between being on like national broadcasts and stuff. <laughs> this is, I'm, I, I'm really, really happy to do this work. You know, I, I've said um, to Megan as well, like I can't be all out in these streets and not in my, my church having these conversations. And so this is, just as important to me as it is to you. And this is not, this is just as meaningful for me as it is for you. This is not a one way street. Um, we are all in this together. We have to be. Um, and so I don't want anybody to think that like, this is, um, this is a labor of love. This is a labor of love. This is not a labor of like, um, oppression or I'm doing you a favor. No, this is so meaningful to me because we have to get this right. We have to get this right. Not just for me, but for my children and my children's children and your children, and your children's children. We have to get this right. We cannot find ourselves here again in another 50 years or, or 20 years. Um, and we're at a really special moment. I've never been more encouraged or empowered to believe that change might actually happen. Um, I even said to Megan, I feel like, you know, coronavirus has, has had some hidden blessings in it and that it's forced us to stop and to really see things that we did not want to see before and engage with people in ways we wouldn't have had to engage before. And so I'm grateful for that. I really am grateful for this, for this platform. Um, even, even via Zoom, I don't even know that I could have reached as many people had we had this in church. So this is, this is great. Well, thank you. Um, I'm just going to give you a little blessing, Kelly. Uh, may the Lord keep you and bless you in your ministry as the way that you are fully uh, embodying who God has made you to be and the gift that you are to the church and to doing God's restorative work in the world. So may God bless you in those endeavors and uh, us as we seek to partner together uh, with God. Um, friends, thank you for being with us tonight uh, for your attention and your questions is phenomenal. Um, the work doesn't stop here. So we keep on together as partners in this. So thanks, thanks friends.